boys and girls. Everybody looks so nice today. Everybody looks their best. Well, we've got an exciting story for you. Are you paying attention? I don't want you to miss anything. It's exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Haley, where are you going? I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven? Well, what do you have in that backpack there? Well... I didn't know you could pack a bag for heaven. Let's see what's inside her bag. I brought a coat. Oh, she brought a coat. Do you think she's going to need a coat in heaven? No. No. You're not going to get cold in heaven. It's going to be the perfect temperature because everything that God creates is perfect and good. It's not going to be cold there. It's not going to be hot there. She won't need that coat. Let's see what else is inside her backpack. Hmm. I got a flashlight. Just in case it's dark and I need to find my way through heaven. Is she going to need that flashlight? No. We don't need a flashlight in heaven. It's, yeah, it's going to be light and sunny and warm forever. God is light. Jesus is light. We're going to find our way around because the light that comes from the throne. We won't need a flashlight. What else is inside that bag? I brought food just in case there's no food in heaven. I brought just a little snack. She brought her own granola bar. Does she need that in heaven? No. No. We don't need to take our own food in a bag to heaven. We're told there's going to be trees in heaven that have lots of beautiful, delicious fruit on them. And there's going to be a tree in heaven that every single month that you walk up to that tree, you're going to find a different kind of fruit on it. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? We're going to have plenty to eat. Yeah, there's lots of good things for us to eat there. We don't need to worry about packing food to go to heaven. What else is inside that bag, Haley? I brought Band-Aids because everybody gets hurt, you know. She brought Band-Aids because everybody gets hurt. Now, that one doesn't surprise me that she packed some Band-Aids to heaven because apparently we use Band-Aids as stickers at home. We put them on the wall, we put them on the babies, we put them on the furniture. But you know what? We're told in the Bible that no one's going to get hurt in heaven. No one's going to get hurt. No one's going to get sick. No one's going to die. And no one's going to cry. So we really don't need to pack Band-Aids to heaven because we're not going to need them. What else is in there? I brought my phone just in case I need to play games. Uh-oh. Does she need her phone in heaven? No. no. There's going to be no Wi-Fi in heaven. There's going to be no data plan in heaven. No internet. I have the feeling that when we get to heaven, between the animals being friendly with us, I think there's going to be lots of stuff for us to do. We won't need our cell phones to play games on or text people or call people. We'll talk to each other face to face. And if there's someone on another planet that we want to see, we're going to have wings and we can fly to the other planets and talk to them face to face. We won't need those cell phones. Do you have anything else in your bag? I don't think so. Well, you know what? I'm glad that you were thinking about getting ready for heaven. Because we all need to think about getting ready for heaven. But you don't need to pack a bag to go to heaven. There's really only one thing that you're going to be able to take to heaven. Do you know what that is? Yeah. No? Us. Our character. And a character is a big word for who you are. That's all that we're going to be able to take to heaven is who we are. Whether we're kind and loving and obey mommy and daddy and obey Jesus, all we can take is our character. And I want each one of you to get ready for heaven, to get your character ready for heaven. Do you know how to get your character ready for heaven? Does it involve packing a bag? No. Getting our characters ready for heaven involves spending time with Jesus. 
reading our Bibles, and praying. The more time, boys and girls, that you spend with Jesus, the more that you'll become like him, and your character will be just like Jesus. And that's all we want to take to heaven, a character just like Jesus. Let's fold our hands and close our eyes, and we're going to say a prayer. Dear Jesus, help each boy and girl Help each adult here. Help us to spend more time with you reading our Bible and praying and help us to get ready for heaven. What a wonderful day it will be. We'll have food. We'll have entertainment. We'll be able to worship before the throne. Prepare us for that great and holy day, we pray. Amen. So for scripture reading, we're going to read in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. If you could go there with us, that would be wonderful. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who con confidence in, is in him. There will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, now's our prayer time, very important time in our church service. And uh, I, uh, I know many of you have things on your heart that, that you really need God to, to answer for you. And I know also that you have things that you're really grateful for. Amen. Hope I see more hands for that. But... Um, as much as possible, why don't we kneel for prayer? Heavenly Father, it's such a blessing to be here today. It's such a blessing to come into your presence. It's such a blessing to feel your Holy Spirit in our hearts because you have poured out on our church today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you brought us here. We thank you that you've seen us through another week. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Father, we take nothing for granted. You saw the hands, Father. There's so many prayers. You're such a great God. I, I don't know how you keep up with everybody's needs. It's an amazing thing, Father, but you hear every prayer and you answer every prayer. But, Father, I know you as Almighty God, you love to be praised. And, Father, you saw all the hands today of people that praise you because they're grateful for all of the good things that have happened in our lives as well. Amen. The greatest of which is you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross. And he willingly did so that we might have eternal life. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. 
We have a lot to be grateful for. I'm grateful for our church, for our family here. Grateful we have a lot of different churches in our community. I'm grateful, Father, we have a, a really great school. And Father, I'm grateful that we have a great hospital in our community that is just outstanding and that a lot of people work and a lot of people reach out to our community through our hospital. Father, today I just ask that you would bless uh, Pastor Grieve as he breaks the bread of life. Anoint his lips from on high that everybody here today would leave here full and overflowing. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am. God identifies himself in the Old Testament as I am. And I personally need more context around that because it's so big. Um, and I heard this song that beautifully conveys what I am can mean to each of us. Throughout the course of our lifetime, um, that is going to mean something very different. But through that course of our lifetime, God continually says to us, whatever and whoever you need right now, I am. Pencil marks on a wall I wasn't always this tall He scattered some monsters from beneath my bed He watched my team win He watched my team lose Watched when my bicycle went down again when I was weak, unable to speak, still I could call you by name. Elbow healer, superhero, come if you Life is so mean What kind of curfew is at 10 p.m.? You saw my mistakes You watched my heart break Heard when I swore I'd never love again When I was weak Unable to speak Still I could call you by name And I said, heartache healer Secret keeper Hold on to my hand And you said I am You saw me wear white by pale candlelight I 
said forever to what lies ahead Two kids and a dream With kids that can scream Too much it might seem When it is to him When I am weak Unable to speak Still I can call you Shepherd maker, pasture maker Hold on to my hand And you said I am The winds of change and circumstance Blow in and all around us So we find a foothold that's familiar Bless the moments that we feel you nearer When life had begun I was woven and spun You let the angels dance around the throne And who can say when But they'll dance again When I am for prayer. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, our I am, our, our everything. Lord, thank you for bringing us to where we are today, but Lord, thank you for not leaving us here either, for continuing to work on, on our hearts, for continuing to grow us and mold us to be more like your son, Jesus. We love you and thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Just by a raise of hands, how many of you went to see fireworks during the last week? A few, a few, maybe some of us, not so much. How many of you at least heard fireworks around going off at your house? Okay, thank you. We at least heard somebody celebrating. How many of you shot off your own fireworks? Yes. The few of you that uh, traveled across the border somewhere to purchase uh, fireworks to bring them back and shoot them off here in Ohio. Well, I hope that everybody had an amazing Independence Day, that you uh, enjoyed yourself. Did you know, just a, a few facts about our 4th of July ceremonies. It was said that this year, the U United States Americans would spend $6.8 billion on food just for 4th of July. That's, that's a lot of money. 150 million hot dogs are eaten each 4th of July. It's a lot of hot dogs. One billion is the amount spent on fireworks, uh, which 67% of fireworks injuries happen within the month of July. Makes sense, at least a little bit. 5.4 million is the value of American flags that are imported annually from China. 
47 million people travel 50 plus miles from home on 4th of July, and there's 16,000 fireworks displays that are held just on 4th of July. And strangely enough, here in Centerville, we host them on the 3rd. I'm not sure what that's about, but that's okay. This year was the 243rd birthday of the United States, if, I, if my math is correct. This is what we do to celebrate independence in our country, right? We, we stop for a day and remember that we are free, right? We remember the sacrifices that people have made in order that we can live and choose to live how we want, to freely do uh, the American dream of uh, having a house and 2.5 kids and whatever that entails for you. Did you take time this Independence Day to really think about what your independence means for you? What does it mean for your daily life? What does it mean for the sacrifices that have people made to give us this freedom? What does independence mean? Susan B. Anthony puts it this way. She says, the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, the constitutions of several states and the organic laws of the territories all alike protect, uh, propose to protect the people and the exercise of their God-given rights. Not one of them pretends to bestow rights. Where do our rights come from? From God, our God-given rights for all of human beings. Abraham Lincoln put it this way, it says, it was that which gave promise that in due time the weights should be lifted from the shoulders of men and that all should have an equal chance. This is the sentiment embodied in that declaration of independence. The idea that we can have an equal chance to live our lives. But what does this mean for me personally, right? I understand what that means for us here in America, for for people across the globe, what freedom and independence means. But what does it mean for me to be able to do my tasks of daily living? Is that important for me? Is it important for me to just be able to brush my teeth and put a shirt on and be able to eat by myself? That's independence, That's something that we all want, right? We want to be able to take care of ourselves. When you're young, it means getting your license, right? Being able to take your parents' car, or if you're lucky enough, your own car, and drive somewhere else on your own. That's freedom. It's independence. And I remember my wife and I, we went to boarding academy and dated through high school and uh, you don't get much freedom in boarding academy. If you went, you understand that. Um, so the first time that we were able to go to my parents' house on home leave and take my parents' car and just go get frozen yogurt and sit by a lake and watch the sunset was amazing. It's like, whoa, we can do this ourselves. We're free just to spend time together without people peering down on us, right? That's freedom. It's independence, being able to do that. And as we grow up, we fight for our independence, right? You know, as you get older, you start to distance yourself from your parents, and thankfully, a lot come back around, right? But we distance ourselves to try and make ourselves who we are, right? I'm old now, I'm, I have my independence. That's what we all want, and it's interesting because at the beginning, we fight for our independence, and also as we get older, we fight for our independence as well. I wanna stay in my home, I've lived here all my life. I don't wanna go anywhere else. I wanna be able to drive, I wanna be able to do things how I've always done them. Independence is important when we're young and when we're old and even in the middle. Kenyon is starting a job as an occupational therapist quite soon and she gave me this quote of kind of uh, what occupational therapy is all about and I I really like it. Um, Basically it's just being able to do things that are meaningful and purposeful for you in your daily life, safely and without modification or aid. So that was a Kenyan Grieve quote. But that's, that's what occupational therapists do, right? Uh, so if, if someone came to her and was needing help, uh, maybe they had a wrist injury, uh, she would help them, if they loved playing guitar, she would have them bring their guitar in so that they could start to work again on how to do the things that they love. It's important for us when we get hurt, when we get sick, Whatever happens, we wanna do what we love. That's independence, that's freedom. The ability to do things without, safely and without modification or aid. It's how we're made, especially here in the US of A. But today I wanna talk about what independence means in God's 
universe. What independence means in our heavenly Father's kingdom. You see, at creation, we all know that at creation, God gave our first parents independence. Right? He gave them free will. The freedom to choose. Because that freedom that God gave us is our ability to love our creator. Without it, love is nothing. It gave us the ability to choose right from evil. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, if you'll turn there. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And it says, Then the Lord God took man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Can you imagine being Adam? Being the first human on this earth and put in this glorious and, and beautiful garden? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Right? In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve a choice. What was that choice? To choose God or themselves. Selfish ambition or the things of God. They could eat of any tree. Can you imagine fruit from the Garden of Eden? I ate a peach last night. That was the best peach I've eaten in years. I grew up in living in Tennessee and Georgia, and there's really good peaches down there. But to have fruit that just melts in your mouth where the taste and the flavor just emanate over everything, can you imagine the fruit of the garden? Wow. If fruit that we have now is good, imagine what that would have been like. So you can eat of any tree, any of the trees, any of the fruits, and I'm sure at that time there was probably more fruits that we don't even know about, except one. Right? There's a choice. There's freedom. You can choose God, but hey, if you don't want to choose me, you can choose the other. Right? God didn't force them to love him. And because of that, that's the only way that they could truly love God. Because without free will, love does not exist. Right? There's, however, a challenge that comes when we look at this. The idea of will I choose God or will I choose myself? Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to be spending most of our time in Jeremiah today. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're going to be looking at trusting man, trusting God, and our own deceitful hearts as well today. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 and 6. God lays it out perfectly for Jeremiah and for the sinful people of Judah through this prophet. The question is, whom will you trust? Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts, who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in a desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. What is it? Cursed is the man? Does God really have to put a curse on a man who chooses to follow his own strength? That's of our own doing, right? That's us choosing sin, choosing my own pride over God. The curse of sin is real. The curse is simply associated with in whom I put my trust. Will I choose God or will I choose myself? Not only does the heart depart from the Lord, but it will be like dry and barren like a shrub in the desert. Have you guys spent much time in the desert? Not much grows there. Amazing cacti and, and, and things that are really hardy might be able to grow in the desert, but it's a harsh and unforgiving landscape. This is the picture of one who does not trust in the Lord, but trusts in man. They are dry and unsustainable. A couple years ago, about two years ago, my wife and I, we took a trip to Salt Lake City. Uh, she was going there for an occupational therapy conference. And while we were there, she, she had meetings. And I was 
there. So I decided, because I, I like to run, I, I decided I was going to look up, hey, what's the best place to go and jog to you know, explore Salt Lake City? So I looked up, and there was this really amazing trail. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, this trail that starts right outside the city of uh, Salt Lake City, and it goes up into the mountains. It's like seven and a half miles up into the mountains. Um, and I thought, you know, well, I'll go and maybe I'll do, you know, a couple miles up and then back and that'll be it. But uh, I got a little bit carried away. I didn't, you know, I, I'm only running four miles. I didn't take my phone. I didn't take extra water. So, you know, I'll just do a couple miles up, a couple miles back. It'll be fine. It'll be all good. So, but then I wanted to see what was around the next corner, <laughs> right? And eventually it got to the point where I'm seven, eight miles up and I have to go seven or eight miles back. And the sun is out, it's a dry heat, and I, you can, you know, in that dry heat, you don't, you don't sweat kind of the same way that we do here, but I could tell that I was starting to get lightheaded. I was starting to realize I didn't have enough, not even just water, but calories in my body. So I get up to the top, and what's really amazing is you start down in the desert where Salt Lake City is, and you get up, and then you're in the mountains where there's snow. So I got up to the top, and I was just like eating snow, because I needed to get some water in my system. And then I realized, okay, well now I need to turn around and go back. Because if I don't, well, I'm going to be here, and that's not good. So I turned around and start, you know, run walking back, and thankfully there was a couple little bathrooms along the way where there was a really sketchy spigot that was sitting outside of it. I was able to get a couple little mouthfuls of water. And eventually, after three or four hours of, of movement, I was able to get back to my car. And I was just thinking after that experience is like, that was really dumb. <laughs> what were you thinking, right? If you had sprained an ankle running down these steep hills, if something had happened to you, that could have been it, right? You hear about people that are stranded out in the wilderness. I, I don't think I even told my wife where I was going, right? She would have had no idea where to send help because she didn't know where I was. Have we spent time in the desert? in our own spiritual life where we, we aren't getting water. And even if there's a spigot every once in a while, even if you come to church every other Sabbath or maybe once a month on Sabbath, you might get a little water here and there, but it's not enough. We need to be having a daily time, daily time spent in God's word to get that life-giving water for us. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm away from water, whenever I'm away from the Lord, my heart wanders from the Lord, right? Whenever I use my independence for personal gain, I am walking in the wilderness. You see, independence is important for us because it allows me to choose to be dependent upon God. Right? Independence is important because it gives me the opportunity to choose God. It gives me the opportunity to choose God. And that's why today I want to live in dependence of God. We have examples throughout scripture that show us what, th what this looks like. For instance, the children of Israel oftentimes were caught in this kind of cycle, right? They would love God. They would fall to, to idols and to sin. They would cry out to God for help. God would send a prophet or a judge uh, to come and, and help them. And then Israel would be delivered. And then Israel would serve the Lord for a time. And then they would get lost and, and travel in the wilderness again over and over and over again. But church, we're, we're not anything different, right? We're caught in that same cycle of sin often enough. It's easy to look back on the children of Israel and be like, really? Why did you not trust God? He was performing all these miracles for you. But we're still su stuck in that same cycle of independence, then dependence, then independence, right? Throughout scripture and in our own lives, we see this same story arc. And I want us to look at a chapter in Joshua, jo Joshua chapter 6. And we'll read verses 1 through 7. This is a story of Jericho. I love this story. It's probably one of the most interesting battles in history. Jericho chapter 6. Oh, Joshua. <laughs> Jericho is in Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel, so they were sieging Jericho. And none went out, and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. 
This you shall do for six days, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua called, son of Nun, called the priests, and said to them, Take of the Ark of the Covenant, and let the priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. How ridiculous. Can you imagine being on one of these walls or, or in the city, and you just see this army in, in full you know, army uniform with their, what you would think was their idol, marching around your city, right? They've laid siege to you, but they're not attacking. They're just marching in circles. When was the last time you thought about this story and just how incredibly ridiculous some of these Israelites must have felt, right? Really, Joshua, this is what you want us to do? This is what God's telling us to do? But they didn't question it, right? They saw that Jericho was pretty much impregnable, and they said, okay, God, this has to be you, right? We have to be dependent upon you within this narrative for it to work. And whom did, did, did Israel trust during the battle of Jericho? They trusted in I am, in God. It was the first obstacle. It was the, the first thing that they had to come across. And they trusted in God. They marched around the cities for six days. They shouted on the seventh. And then the walls came a tumbling down. What great faith to do that for seven days straight and not see any change. And then for, you know, it's not like they created an earthquake with their marching. It had to have been God, right? That's the only explanation so the Israelites see this, and then we move on to chapter 7. Flip over your page or turn your gaze to chapter 7, verse 1. And we see that the children of Israel have short-term memory loss. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. God just won this incredible battle for you. And he only asked of one thing. Don't take any of the stuff. Don't take any of the, the loot that you would normally take. But you do it anyway. All you had to do was march and shout, and now you disobey orders and take things from Jericho. In their own independence, not depending upon God. Let's see what happens. After Jericho, the Israelites come upon the small village of Ai, right? They were blocked in their path, and after looking at Ai's defenses, they look and they say, oh, you know, we don't need to send our whole army out there. We just defeated Jericho, We'll just send a couple thousand men. They'll be fine, right? No big deal. We just defeated this mighty city. Do you see how they shifted from being dependent to being independent? We can take out that city easily. The shift was that easy and it was that subtle. How about you? How about me? God just provided the extra money you need to pay the bills, but I can take care of my relationship problems on my own. I trusted God to find me a job, but now I'm going to depend on myself to do it. So quickly we can move from living in dependence of God to living independent from Him. Ai was no threat, certainly nothing like Jericho. Let's read on in verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. 
And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Sherebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. God was not present because of the disobedience, but Joshua, if he had sought God's will, would have known that now was not the time to attack Ai. Now was not the time. Israel's tragic defeat at Ai could have been prevented had Joshua and his officers completely understood what their dependency on God looked like. That every step they made into the promised land had to be ordained by their heavenly father. Otherwise, we see what happens. Like Israel, our shift from dependence to independence may be almost imperceptible. Yes, we are truly grateful when God intervenes and wins an important victory in our lives. But immediately afterward, we venture forward on our own as if we don't have to depend on God for the small things of life. Many Christians fall into this trap, myself included. This was the source of Paul's frustrations when he was talking to those foolish Galatians. Turn with me to Galatians 3, chapter 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 3. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Having begun in spirit, are you now being made perfect by flesh? You see, the Galatians, they were deceived into thinking that spiritual growth or maturity could be achieved through works of the flesh. Instead of a continued simple faith and abiding in Jesus. How about you and me, church? How about us? Am I depending upon myself for my spiritual growth? Or am I abiding in Jesus? Because dependence upon God is not something we only muster during emergencies. It is the realization that apart from God, we cannot even presume our next breath. Not even our next breath. Dependence sees God as being everything. Independence sees him as merely a resource for dealing with crises. Dependence is an expression of faith. Independence is an expression of pride. Dependence is confidence in God. Independence trusts the arm of flesh. Dependence surrenders the need to control every aspect of my life. Independence puts us on our own throne. At Jericho, Israel trusted in God and followed him into one of the most interesting victories in history. But at Ai, the Israelites allowed pride into their hearts and relied on their own power and might. To prevail. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 to 8. And it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in who? In the Lord, and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots over the river or by the river and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Nor will it cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah is drawing on the images of Psalms chapter 1 where the blessed man is the one who delights in the word of God. Jeremiah that thought that trusting in the Lord was the same thing as delighting in God's word. Here's what amazing, the man that we read about earlier, the man who trusts in himself, he's like a bush in the desert. 
nothing to support it. Even if a good rain comes, the bush does not gain enough. I remember growing up and whenever I would go to my, my mom's mom's house, my grandmother's house, uh, we would watch nature documentaries. And there was always one that we loved watching about the desert and about the, the cacti and the animals that would live in the desert. But then it would talk about flash floods that would flow through or when rainstorms came. There's all these seeds that have been lying dormant that grow up suddenly, right? They're excited. And then when the water vanishes, the sun burns them and they wither and die. Is that what our faith looks like? Do we get excited when we come to church? Do we get excited when we go to a revival weekend? But then do we wither and die because we aren't going to the source of strength that we learned about in the first place? Even when the truth or water comes, they will be parched just like when I was in Salt Lake City. But the man or woman that depends upon the Lord will be like this tree. This tree that's planted by the water. Sounds like a tree I'd want to hang a hammock in and just spend time enjoying the, the, the freshness of the water. And it looks amazing. But even when drought comes to this tree, it will not be affected because it has underground sources from which it can gain life. It has a comfort in the hour of trial. It drinks up the water and it flourishes. Are you connected to the source? Are you going back to the source of our strength? In your independence, have you declared that, no, in my independence, I am going to be dependent upon God? Psalms chapter 1 says it this way, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the feet of, seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, on his character, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Are you like that tree? Do you want to declare that today is your day of dependence upon God? That every day of your life is a day that you want to declare that you are dependent on your heavenly Father? Because in my independence, the independence that people have fought for, I want to declare that I am dependent upon him. Dependence day is every day. A day to declare that Jesus is my Lord, the Lord of my life, and I want to live my life dependent upon him. How can I live out dependence with my independence? As David and Jeremiah both said, by delighting in the truth. Delighting in the truth, meditating upon God's law of love and being humbled before the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Some of my favorite books growing up were the, the Chronicles of Narnia. I, I loved listening to those in the car when we take road trips. It was just, just wrapped up in, up in the storytelling and the if you've read the books, you know that there's a, a Christ-like figure named Aslan. And in Prince Caspian, Lucy, one of the, she was the littlest girl in, in the, the book that most people know about, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But now she's a little bit older. And she comes and she meets Aslan for the first time in a long time. And she says, Aslan, you're bigger. You've grown, you're bigger, she says. And he says, that is because you're older, older little one. Not because you are. I am not bigger, but every year you grow, you will find me, you will find him bigger. What about for us? Has your time in scripture, has your time in church, has your time in Bible study with friends and family, have you grown to realize that God is so much bigger than our little minds can comprehend? How amazing is our God? I am constantly humbled before his awesome power and before Jesus. That's why they say to meditate on Jesus. 
How can we feel big and prideful in ourselves when we see the life of Jesus? How about you and me? Every year that you grow, has God grown bigger? Or has ego and independence grown so large that as you've only gained knowledge of God, you have not realized the depth and breadth of our Heavenly Father? I don't know about you, but I'm just continuously humbled before God. And I want to declare that every day should be dependence day. Depending upon God. Let's look at our last couple of verses here. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses nine and 10. Why should I give up my independence? I fought so hard for my independence. Why should I do that and become dependent upon God? Jeremiah 17, verses nine and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I am the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to get every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The word used here for heart is love. And heart in in Hebrew, it could mean inner man, it could mean mind, it could mean will, it could mean our thinking, our conscience, or even our understanding. The other word here used for deceitful is asaph. It means sly or insidious or slippery. Have you ever tried to climb up a slip and slide that's on the side of a hill or gone skiing and lost a ski and had to try and climb back up? A slippery slope is hard to climb and, and, and nigh impossible to get back up. So what it's saying here, it says, the heart, the inner man, my mind, my will, my thinking, my conscience and understanding is slippery. It's insidious, it's sly, and it's deceitful above what? All things. I don't want us to miss that. All things, not just a few things, everything. It's the deceit, most deceitful thing out there, says Jeremiah. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows the human condition. And Jesus took on that condition and overcame for us. Amen. Amen. I don't want us to forget that. But I think it's important for us to understand where our hearts and our minds are so that we can understand how much more we need to depend upon God. Ellen White in Christ Object Lessons puts it this way and I think it's extremely poignant. She says, no man can of himself understand his errors. No man can understand their own errors. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way, only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. Only one way. We must behold Christ. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness, just like every other sinner. We will see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. Independence Day, every day. A day to declare that Jesus is Lord of my life and I want to live my life dependent upon him. This week we got to celebrate our independence as a nation. What a blessing that is to be able to celebrate that we are free to choose, to celebrate those that gave their lives, gave parts of their lives to allow us to have that freedom. For those of you that have served in our nation's military, I say thank you. Thank you so much for giving us freedom. But I hope that each and every one of us will take that hard-earned independence and give it to God. 
give that independence to God. But how do I do that? By meditating upon his word. By carving out time, fasting from our cell phones, fasting from the day-to-day grind to give time to God in prayer, in his words, in our actions. John 15, 3, abide in me and I in you. (laughs) As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Dwell on the character of Christ. The disciples asked Jesus, who, Lord, is the greatest? Who will be the greatest in your kingdom? Jesus answered with an illustration. He called a little child to him. He placed the little child in and among the disciples and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's one quality of a little child? Dependence. They are dependent for others for their well-being. God's children should share that quality of depending on their loving Heavenly Father for everything they need. Lord, help us to depend on you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, empty us of ourselves. Lord, remove the pride and take us to a place of humility. In our independence, let us not claim that for ourselves, but give it up to you. Because Lord, you know the plans for our lives. Lord, I ask that you be with each family here, that they would carve out time in their families to be with you, with their, with their children, uh, with, with whomever is in their household, that they would take time to dwell next to your stream, to be dependent on you through the good, through the bad, through everything. Lord, help us to take the faith and the good things you've done for us in the past and, and move those forward and continue to grow our faith because you are good, Lord. Lord, help us to take this message and not leave it here in your church, but take it out. Take it out of our church and, and learn to depend on you wholly. We thank you. We praise you. And we can't wait to see you. In your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.